Justice Tech Pros podcast with Dominic Crea, one of the most unique podcasts on the internet, discussing the obstacles the defense team faces when trying a case, what goes on behind the scenes during pretrial and motion phase, holding defense attorneys accountable, making sure they're fighting for their clients, the difference between textbook law and how things truly play out in a courtroom, and everything in between. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Justice Tech pros. Welcome back to the Matt Cave. Welcome back to A View from Mulberry Street. I am Matthew J. Mary, and I am your host. And today we've got a great interview with a prolific author and crime writer. He's written numerous, numerous books, but many, many books about organized crime. Some of that people that I know. Okay, our guest today uh, will be Anthony M. Stefano, and his books include Mob Killer, Gotti's Boys, Gangland New York, The Deadly Dawn, The Big Heist, about the Lufthansa heist, you know, good fellas, Top Hoodlum, Frank Costello. Vinnie Gorgeous, Vincent Bassiano, who is my friend and my client right now, still trying to get Vinnie Bassiano out of jail. And uh, finally, last but not least, King of the Godfathers, Joe Messina, my former client, my former friend, someone I know an awful lot about. And so here we go. Welcome to the show, Tony D. Stefano. Thank you. You got the last name right. You get a credit for that. Tony, tell me, how, you know, as a journalist, as an author, as a writer, how did you get into this area of organized crime? Well, I mean, uh, it started years ago when we were working, I was a cub reporter working at Fairchild Publications. And, uh, you know, it was basically a fashion publication outlet. And the editors at Women's Wear Daily wanted to do stories about the mob in 7th Avenue, the garment district. And uh, they assigned us a task of doing that. It took us six months uh, because we were the blind leading the blind. We knew nothing about the subject. And, um, you know, we found out a lot. We found out a lot. I mean, the five families were involved and there was a big history, rich history, some of which you're probably familiar with. And then from there, I went to, uh, when I went to Newsday, I started writing about organized crime for Newsday. And, uh, you know, from there, it just went, you know, covered Messino's trial. And from there, I got a book uh, uh, out of that. And then from that, it was just one book after another. Tony, uh, do you still work for Newsday as a, as a, as a reporter on a, on a daily basis? Still do, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to ask you, before we get into a couple of subjects that I have great familiarity with, I want to ask you, what's your latest project? What are you working on right now, if anything? Well, I'm working on a, a book that is centered on the Prohibition era in New York City, uh, particularly about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, how shall I say, the Lady Racketeers of Prohibition. Mm. Interesting subject, one that's really, really plumbed into very much. But it uh, involves a notorious murder, and also uh, ultimately the uh, uh, it contributed to a group of events which led to the uh, resignation of uh, then Mayor Jimmy Walker. So it's, a, it's a, a lot of work, but it was fun to do. I want to get right into a couple of areas that I have some knowledge of, and we have common knowledge of. I mean, uh, you did write a book uh, concerning John Gotti, the Gotti boys. I knew John pretty well, and, and you know, he's got his public persona. As far as I'm concerned, John Gotti, to me, and my relationship with him, was a gentleman. Uh, he was uh, very, very uh, uh, cordial to me every time I met him, every time I saw him. Um, you did a book about Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. Uh, I didn't get to meet them. They're a little bit before my time. But uh, when we get to uh, Vinny Bassiano and Joe Messina, those are two people that I know very well. With regard to your book, I think the title was Vinny Gorgeous. How did you decide to do a, a book about Vincent Bassiano, Vinny Gorgeous? 
Well, I, I covered his trial. He had a couple of federal trials. Uh, I covered the first one and the second one. Uh, they were all in Brooklyn federal court. And, uh, you know, that gave me a, a whole background, a whole sort of trove of material to work with. And I got to know his family a little bit, uh, his wife and his sons, and, uh, you know, created a rapport and, uh, you know, just plumbed around because I covered Messino and Messino was the guy who, in a sense, sold Vinny down the river uh, by talking secretly. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's, you know, that's a good book. That's a good story. I think it is. Bassiano was accused of, of murdering two people. And, and with all due respect to the victims, you know, this guy Santoro, uh, Vin, Vinny Bassiano is accused of, of murdering him. But Vinny Santoro was a local drug dealer, as far as I know. And, um, and he was plotting to kidnap Vinny Bassiano's son. And the other murder involved in the Vinny Bassiano cases was a guy named Randy Pizzolo, who was quite a, a maniac, according to all sorts of accounts. Uh, he's someone who threatened to, quote, kill the entire Bonanno family. I mean, having viewed Vinny Bassiano's trial, do you think that even if he were guilty, and believe me, he tells me he's innocent, and I'm fighting for that, but if he were guilty, is are those the kind of crimes where someone should be facing the death penalty and given life without parole times two? Well, you know, I, I the intricacy of the death penalty law in that particular case, uh, right now I'm a little fuzzy on, but uh, Vinny, Vinny beat the death penalty. The jury wasn't convinced that his life was worth taking. Uh, look, the statute is what it is. Uh, the government has to make a choice. But I think in Brooklyn, uh, the juries don't like the death penalty. And that's where he was tried. I mean, you had one case where there was a death penalty verdict, and that involved a cop killer. But they reversed the death penalty finding because there was questions about the defendant's mental status and age. Uh, well, mental status, really, not his age. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I mean, the government, I think, had had it in for Vinny in the sense that they accused him of plotting to kill a prosecutor at some point. I think we all know that that wasn't true. That had to do with Santeria, where Vinny had, had yeah. you, know, you know, you could explain that. Whether that's credible or not, you know, it's really up to uh, debate and discussion. Uh, I was never really convinced uh, that he wanted to go through with that. Uh, well, he may have mouthed off about it, uh, in, in, you know, to some people in the past. I didn't think it was a, a credible threat. Uh, and I, I think that um, uh, the Centuria element was sort of weird. Uh, and it, it really, in my mind, didn't, didn't indicate any uh, plot to kill the prosecutor. But be that as it may, I think they had it in for him. And going for the death penalty, I think, was an indication that, you know, that they really wanted to get this guy, uh, Vinny. Uh, but in the end, he beat, that. he beat the death penalty verdict because, you know, he had certain qualities that the defense brought out through the witnesses about his, his uh, kindness to people, uh, his nurturing of the, you know, for the family, his fam you know, his, his uh, wife and children and the relationships uh, he had cultivated outside of his, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, crime life, as it were. So the jury, I think, considered him uh, to be somebody who wasn't worth, you know, executing. I mean, he didn't merit the death penalty, so he escaped. Anthony, I've been told that, that Vinny Bassiano initially, I wasn't his trial lawyer, that he initially was offered seven years to cover, um, pardon me, 10 years to cover everything. And his lawyer actually told me uh, uh, that, that he probably could have gotten Vinny seven years, but Vinny was adamant about going to trial. And I think that the government was adamant about Vinny becoming a cooperator. I mean, they had already flipped the subject of your other book, Joe Messino. And uh, I think they were anxious to have another feather in their cap 
by having Vinny cooperate. But Vinny is the type of guy who would never cooperate, even under penalty of, of death. I mean, I think he was a very stand-up guy uh, in terms of that life. Uh, I, I don't think he would have cooperated. Uh, I think if he wanted to take a seven-year or ten-year stretch and just get this over with, you know, he would have been out in eh, seven, eight years. Uh, he would have been a relatively young man. And what he has now is life. So you make, you make a calculation, you do the math, and you figure out what you want to do. If they were trying to get him to take the plea, if this was true, uh, for seven or ten years and cooperate, I don't think they were going to get a guy like that to cooperate. He just wasn't a guy who was going to go against his... Uh, his own creed, as it were. That's for sure. But another subject of one of your books, the Vinnie Gorgeous book was about Vinnie Bassiano, but you also wrote King, King of the Godfathers, Joe Massino, who allegedly was Vinnie Bassiano's boss, and uh, Joe decided, after being convicted uh, in federal court, that he was going to cooperate and he did cooperate against none other than the other subject of, of a book, Vinnie Bassiano. Tell me a little bit about Joe Messino doing that to Vinnie Bassiano. Well, I think that what entered into Joe's mind was that he was in, he had a number of cases. The case, his big trial, which got him essentially a life term. But there was also another component, which was a death penalty component. And his co-defendants all got removed from the death penalty calculation. They weren't, the government was going to go after death penalty for them, except for Joe. And Joe, I think, felt put out by that. And he saw everybody else getting out from under the death penalty and just him facing it. I think, you know, I didn't speak to him about it, but I think he didn't want to be the guy holding the bag. So he decided if there's any way I can get out from under the death penalty, if it takes cooperation, that's going to be it. And I think Joe attempted to cooperate as soon as he was convicted in that first trial, the one where he was convicted, I think, of the complicity in the six murders, including, the, I think, the three captains. Um, uh, and right after he was convicted, I remember I was in the courthouse and I went down back to my office, which was down the hall from Judge Garifuss's chambers and courtroom. And I noticed the door in the corridor was closed. I said, that never happened. Why are they doing that? Subsequently, we found out that Messino went in to talk to Garifas and say he wanted to cooperate. And at that point, uh, Garifas, I think, got him assigned a counsel. I think it was Ed McDonald. And uh, from there, you know, Joe went the cooperation route. I think he did it to get out from the death penalty. He felt he was the man holding the bag, and he didn't want to do that. One interesting aspect of the relationship between two of your subjects, Joe Messino and Vinny Bassiano, was that when they were very strangely, but not now so strangely, uh, we understand why it happened, they were put into the same area uh, at the courthouse and were able to talk to each other. And while Joe Messino was the so-called boss of the Bonanno family, and Vinny was the so-called acting boss, Joe Messino was, in fact, wired up and working for the government. And Joe Messino consistently badgered Vinny Bassiano to tell him about a certain murder. And at one point, and this is all on tape, this is nothing I'm revealing, this is on tape, it's the subject of a lot of legal activity, at one point, Joe Messino tells Bassiano, I want an answer from you. After Bassiano refused to answer him like a hundred times, Messino tells Bassiano, I am your boss, when he's really a government cooperator, all right, at the same time. And Messino tells him, you, do you understand that I'm asking you a question and you have to give me an answer? Basically threatening Bassiano. And yet the courts ignored all of that. And they said, yeah, oh, that's okay. Even though uh, Messino was a, uh, a government operative wired up, he's still able to bully Bassiano 
uh, into making a, a, a statement, a, 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 an incriminating statement, because Messino tells Bassiano, I am your boss. You better answer me. I mean, did you cover that in either of your books? Well, I, I think I covered that session where they were together uh, and the taping, the taping, the tape recording that was going on. So that I covered that. Um, I don't remember every element of the tape uh, and everything that Messino or Bassiano said. Uh, I'd have to go back to the book. But it seemed to me that, you know, Messino was the boss at that point. Uh, Bassiano had the option of uh, of covering himself, in my mind. If if he was being badgered, he could have told him, oh, you know, said something that wouldn't have been truthful, which would have insulated him from some sort of liability. But I think he felt that he had no reason to think that Joe was taping him, and it turned at that point. He found out later, of course. Uh, so, you know, I think he had, a, you know, he felt, he felt probably, this is speculation, that he had to talk to Joe and, you know, be frank with him. Uh, could he have protected himself, Vinny? Possibly. Uh, uh, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how you know, your, your arguing goes uh, with the courts that uh, if you're using this to, to try to get... Uh, either the conviction uh, reversed or something. I don't know, maybe your strategy is, Matt, you don't have to tell me. Uh, but um, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Part of the, the, the mission of, of this podcast is to bring to the public's attention the fact that these defendants in federal cases who are accused of being members of organized crime, especially the ones accused of being bosses, that they're treated differently than any other defendant. And it seems like the primary purpose of the government in arresting and prosecuting these fellows is not so much to hold them responsible for crimes, but to get them to flip and to get all of them to flip. It seems that that's, that's the, 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 their mission. Uh, in the courtroom. Would you agree with that or disagree? Well, I, I, I can say that, you know, from the limited history that I have, I don't have the extensive history that you do uh, in these cases, but uh, it seems that getting people to cooperate has often been a goal in these cases, be they the boss or an underboss or, you know, a captain or some lesser light. Uh, so I think that that's, you know, I think it's, fair to say that that has been a tactic in some of these cases and will continue to be. Uh, whether there are enough um, significant people in that life for there to be cooperation against or cooperation from is another question. Uh, but I, I think that's, you know, it's fair to say history shows that that has been a government tactic, you know, getting cooperators. Uh, and they say that you know, in Howard Beach or in places like that, where there's a uh, some of these guys live, that a good career path is to be a cooperator. <laughs> I, uh, be, they, they become cooperators, and then they become podcasters. You know, instead of going to jail for life for murder, they get off the hook, and then they figure out more ways to make money. But but you know, interesting that you said. In the Eastern District of New York, where there have been quite a few death penalty cases, I tried the first federal death penalty uh, case in the history of New York back in 1990. It was the case of uh, Thomas Patera, also known as Tommy Karate. And in that case, the, the government's prosecutor in the death penalty phase said to the jury, if, if Tommy doesn't deserve to die, then who does? And the jury answered him by saying, no way, we're not going to kill this guy. We're not going to execute him. So, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of getting these organized crime guys uh, to try to flip because you're, you're, you're threatening them with the death penalty seems not to work all the time. Maybe it worked in the case of Joe Messina, but Joe, Joe Messina swore in, in, in court on another case where he was a a witness for the government that the death penalty wasn't the reason that he flipped. It was his financial condition of his family. But anyhow, uh, they, they seem to be using this tactic 
of, of threatening people with the death penalty. And the juries and seem to be rejecting the death penalty option. In the Eastern District, the, the juries of uh, uh, by and large rejected the death penalty, except for that one case I told you about, the cop killing case. Uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's tough for a jury. Uh, uh, I remember one death penalty case that happened around Christmas time of one year, and the defendant's mother testified uh, in a very compelling testimony that says, you know, if anybody should be uh, on the dock, in the dock, in this chair for the death penalty, it should be me because I didn't take care of my son uh, the right way. And it was Christmas time. And who's going to, you know, I don't think the jury had the stomach for that. Uh, now, other districts may be different, but uh, we have a case right now in Southern District where there's a terrorist case, the, uh, the Halloween uh, rampage on the West Side, uh, which killed eight people. Uh, and that's a death penalty case. And that's going to the penalty phase right now. So we're going to see what's going to happen with that. But that's Manhattan, not Brooklyn. Anthony, during the course of your career, you did bucks on some interesting people like Joe Messino, like Vinnie Bassiano, like Vito Genovese, like Frank Costello, like John Gotti. During the course of, of your investigations to, to write these books, were there anything, any facts that popped up at you that surprised you about these people? Anything positive, maybe? Well, I mean, I think that... Uh... Uh, you know, there were some positive aspects to their life. Messino was a family man in terms of his wife and daughters and grandkids. You know, he was very uh, protective of them and very um, uh, solicitous uh, and tried to be a good father and grandfather. Uh, Vinny, I think, you know, uh, had his issues, but uh, in, in the end, I think he had the loyalty of his you know, wife and children. In terms of Frank Costello, uh, Frank, I think, really wanted to get away from that life. He wanted to be considered legitimate. Um, and hence, he was gravitating to the legitimate side. He was a gambler, and no question about it. But then again, gambling, where depending where you are, it's not necessarily an offense. Vito, uh, you know, more complicated. He, I think, had an inferiority complex versus Costello. He wanted to be the boss. Costello was considered sort of the grand prime minister of that uh, family. And I think Vito felt, you know, slighted and and not given the, the deference and, and due that he was that should have had. Uh, he was um, very loving Vito. He had this love hate relationship, him and his wife, Anna. And she testified against him in a divorce hearing. Uh, they didn't get divorced, by the way. And uh, but in the end, they they had this continuous relationship, even when he went to prison. And he gave her his not only his social security uh, allotment when he died, but also um, she's buried with him out in St. John's Cemetery. So they kept this relationship, love hate in a strange sort of way, but they stayed together, and that sort of. No, surprising because you would have thought that somebody might have had the wife killed uh, if she turned on him that way or disappeared, or whatever. And that didn't happen with Vito. Uh, I think he really, in the end, loved his wife Anna. Uh, so that kind of surprised him. In the book, the the big heist that was about the Lufthansa case, which later became a movie called. Goodfellas, a very famous movie. Did you uncover any facts uh, during that case that, that we don't know about? It depends on what you know. I mean, um, the movie, the heist, was given some mention, but, you know, Henry Hill wasn't involved in the heist itself. He was involved in maybe the initial planning. I don't think they, some people trusted him. I think that was something that, uh, you know, uh, was different from what you saw in the film. I mean, he was not a main player in that, and he wasn't considered uh, trustworthy by some of the characters involved in the heist. I think the uh, the fact that um, Jimmy Burke seemed to squander, not squander, but gather a lot of the money and didn't pay out people the way he was supposed to, uh, that surprised me. 
because he left a bad taste with people, uh, particularly Vinny Asaro, who was on tape complaining that you know Jimmy Burke uh, didn't give people their due. Um, it, it was it was interesting also because there were so many the way the feds tried to come at this many years later with the case against the Saro, and they thought they had a locked case. But what surprised me was the fact that I think that when it came down to it, the jury was looking at a very old man, Vinny was, Vinny Asaro, and they couldn't hold him, I think, responsible for a lot of what would happen. Like, this is just one old broken down guy, broken police of a guy. And the, the government thought they had a strong case. And in the end, they didn't. And that surprised a lot of us. In, in the end, thought, Vinny Asaro yeah. got an acquittal. He got an acquittal. Uh, and, uh, of course, he got jammed up later on in another case. Uh, spent some time in jail on that. But then got out, I think, for a health reasons or compassionate release or whatever. And I, now I don't know where he is. I think he you know, may be living at home or maybe in a assisted living facility someplace. Who knows? Okay, Anthony. I want to thank you very much for being a, a guest this week on A View from Mulberry Street. You know, I've enjoyed all of your books, and I've enjoyed knowing you over the years. You're a real high-class guy. I want to wish you the best of luck on your new project. And... Um, that's about it for now. Well, thank you, well, thank you uh, Matt. I, you know, I appreciate uh, your straightforwardness and you know, the, the, the fact that you're pursuing your, your job with a passion, representing people. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have your point of view, and I think it guides you in what you do. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best. Before we sign off, I want to explain to our stalwart viewers, the people who watch every week and expect us to be there every Tuesday, and the people who watch from beginning to end, I want to explain, you know, we apologize for not being on every Tuesday, but, you know, I have a day job. I'm still a lawyer, and my partner, Neil Healy, he still has a day job as a Hollywood producer. So it's not that easy to get the product out every week, every Tuesday. But we're going to try our best. We're also uh, exploring different kinds of programming. Maybe we're going to do some shorts. Maybe we're going to do some different kind of things. We're, we're putting everything into the hopper and trying to, to analyze where we go from here. We're also looking for sponsorship options, okay? We, we need a, a single sponsor to really take us where we want to go. Uh, and before I close, I just want to give a shout out to Charlene and Arthur from Connecticut. I want to say hi to Nikki from Donico's Restaurant in Mulberry Street, on Mulberry Street in Little Italy. And finally, I want to give all our love to Janet from Juliana's Restaurant in Staten Island. Janet, we love you. And that is a view from Mulberry Street. Thank you.